Good morning, everybody. Um, things have been quite exciting in our house this morning. Rebecca has developed a temperature, which unfortunately means that we're unable to be with you this morning. But we trust that God will be at work through his word um, as we look at Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 to 20 together. The 2nd of April 1966. Keithley, Yorkshire. Father, Geoffrey Nutter. Mother, Patricia Nutter. These are the details recorded on the birth certificate of Rebecca Lindsay Nutter. Now inspired by her birth, later that year, England went on to win the World Cup. And she's the only woman that I could persuade to take on the name Hope Gill. They're the ordinary details of time, place and family recorded at the registration of births all over the world. They're traceable details. They let you be sure who somebody is. Luke has been investigating the details of Jesus's birth. And right at the start of his gospel, he tells us he's taken great care, gathering evidence from authoritative eyewitnesses. Why? He wants you who love God to be certain that your faith in Jesus is based on real events. Events that fulfil God's purposes. You can trust what he's written. Some of the events seem ordinary. Some of them are extraordinary. But there's the glory of God in all of them. And they require a response from us. So we're going to look at this passage under three headings. A time, a place, a birth, glory in the ordinary. A glimpse of heaven, glory in the extraordinary the witnesses, glory in the response. So firstly, the first seven verses, glory in the ordinary, a time, a place, a birth. Now, Rebecca had been struggling with the heat when we were in India. So she went on a, a trip to New Delhi with Jenny Ramble and Jenny suggested doing a test just in case. I was up in Rupadia, eight hours away at the time, and then I got a phone call. Rebecca was pregnant. What followed was months of increasing anticipation. What would the baby be like? I'd been looking at the ultrasound during our appointment and I was convinced that we were going to have a boy. Then, at last, on the 28th of December 1998, at the Jessops Hospital for Women in Sheffield, our first child, a beautiful baby girl, Grace Elizabeth was born. Luke starts this section of the gospel with the phrase, in those days. And he wants you to cast your mind back to chapter one, because there is vital context for this child. This is what we know. Mary has been visited by an angel, Gabriel. She's told that her child will be conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, not by man. How? Because with God, nothing is impossible. He'll be called Son of the Most High. He'll reign on the throne of the greatest Jewish king, David. The anticipation rises and rises as the reader is shown in chapter one that this child will fulfill all the Old Testament prophets. He's the serpent crusher of Genesis chapter three. He'll fulfill God's covenant with Abraham. In chapter one, Luke's recorded declaration after declaration about the identity and mission of this child. He'll save humanity from all the effects of the fall sin, disease, even death, he'll be a divine, glorious Lord. 
A few months ago, I was having a conversation with a colleague and he was describing an eminent surgeon he'd trained under. He used the phrase, so-and-so is an august surgeon. Now, my colleague was basking in the reflected glory, although I was wondering what his mentor did the rest of the year. In our passage, Augustus Caesar has ordered a census and he was the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. And originally he was called Gaius Octavius or Octavian. And he was one of three people who ruled the Roman Empire. The other two were Lepidus and Antony. But when Antony started showing more interest in Cleopatra than in Rome, Octavian defeated him in battle. And the reward was a new title, which was bestowed on him by the Roman Senate, Augustus. It means sublime, majestic, highly revered. Luke is giving us verifiable historical detail as part of his careful investigation. So you can be certain who Jesus is. Caesar thought he was administering taxes. More taxes meant more power, more buildings and wealth, a bigger army, more majesty for the august one. Yet God was using Caesar's degree for the fulfilment of his purposes for the church. Joseph and the heavily pregnant Mary were obedient to the authority of Caesar and they made the exhausting 90 mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem to the town where King David had been born, surrounded by the fields where he had tended sheep as a boy, the fields belonging to Boaz, where Ruth had gleaned wheat. It was also the town that Micah, the prophet 800 years ago, had prophesied would be where an extraordinary future ruler would be born. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old, from days of eternity. Luke is emphasising again and again the royal credentials of this child. Details registered for the world to see in a Roman census. It lets you be certain about who Jesus is. The fulfilment of all the Davidic promises. When Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem, they couldn't find proper accommodation. So they had to lodge with the animals. Then, at last, he was born. This highly anticipated, divine, royal baby was lovingly wrapped in cloths and placed in an animal feeding trough. When I was a young boy, I used to snuggle up to my dog in her bed. She was a black Labrador called Sheba. Her bed was a dark, smelly pit under a table in our utility room full of dog hair. But I liked it because there I could tell Sheba my woes, particularly when I was feeling sorry for myself. Sheba, you're the only one who understands me. Now Sheba knew some words very well, like dindins, and she could pick up on my emotions, but she couldn't really understand my hopes, fears and dreams, because she was a dog. If communicating real human concerns with a dog is difficult, what if I wanted to communicate my hopes with the bacteria living on my skin? How would I do it? Maybe I could nudge them or Maybe I could send them a chemical message. Actually, it would be impossible because we are so different. And this is a bit like the problem God has communicating with us because God 
and humanity are so different. Psalm 113 says this, The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? At least I have the fact that I'm a creature with the same basic biochemical structures in common with bacteria. Yet God is uncreated, eternal and transcendent. Do you start to see something of the incredible humility of Jesus? The Apostle Paul put it like this. He was in very nature God, yet did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, in Philippians 2. So while Caesar was grasping after greater wealth so the world could gaze on his man-made majesty, the eternal King of glory was humbling himself to be born as a vulnerable baby, his majesty purposefully veiled. The humility of the feeding trough would foreshadow the greater humiliation to come, when the world would stare and gloat at his naked body on a cross. There's no room available for Jesus when he was born, It's a picture of hearts too overcrowded with wanting approval or filled with anxiety or chasing money and comfort, heavy with cares or just self-absorption with how I'm feeling today. Hearts so crowded that there's no room for Jesus too. There's nothing more down to earth and ordinary than the birth of a baby. Do you see the glory of God in this birth? Jesus did it for you. Secondly, we're going to look at verses eight to 14. Glory in the extraordinary and a glimpse of heaven. Now, ancient Jewish shepherds had a problem. Nobody wanted them around. They lived in fields, so they stank. They couldn't keep the regulations of Mosaic law due to their job. They weren't even allowed to give testimony in court. They were a despised class. Then it all happened with dramatic speed. One moment, there was just the sounds of the night. The shepherd's pupils were dilated as they accommodated to the darkness and the odd prick of lantern light in nearby Bethlehem. Then out of nowhere, an angel of the Lord, holy, strong, brilliant. They hadn't seen him coming. At the same time, heavenly brightness flashed all around them. The glory of the Lord. It's not surprising the shepherds feared with great fear, verse 9. The appearance of the glory of the Lord is rare in the Bible. It's extraordinary. It only occurred at particular times of importance when God was revealing himself to his people. The glory of the Lord appeared on Mount Sinai when God took Israel into covenant relationship with himself in Exodus 19. Then again, when Solomon dedicated the temple and God dwelt amongst his people, 1 Kings 8. And do you see those two things coming together? Now, once more, the glory of heaven is revealed, this time to the despised. It heralds wonderful, wonderful news. Before they can take anything in, the shepherds have to 
regain their composure. Do not be afraid, or cheer up and get a grip. The angel's words are a command. What they're about to hear is important. To hear good news about Jesus requires a clear-headed understanding of what is true. So whilst hearing about Jesus can cause us to be moved, it's not emotionalism. But it's news that brings deep-rooted, satisfying and lasting joy. It's for everyone, even shepherds, even you. And the word born stands close to the beginning of the sentence, because born to you this day. The angel is saying long ago, promised, 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 and now finally born to you, shepherds, even to you. The angel builds layer upon layer of truth about who Jesus is in verse 11. And each phrase is loaded with rich meaning. He's the Messiah, the promised one, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be his people's great prophet, sympathetic high priest, eternal king. He's the Lord, he's God himself. And throughout the gospel, Jesus will reveal this. His words and actions will leave no doubt that he's not just a man. It's evidence. But the emphasis is on saviour. Everything else, above everything else, Jesus is a saviour. He's not simply come to tell you to pull your socks up. He's not simply come as a social reformer. He's come as a rescuer because you're helpless. But why? Why would he leave the glory of heaven to humiliate himself in this way? And when we were first married, Rebecca and I used to have conversations that went a bit like this. Ben, why do you love me? Now, it's an impossible question to answer. I could say it's because she's beautiful, which she is. She'll be pleased that I think she's beautiful. But then she may start to feel anxious and think, will he still love me when I get old and less beautiful? If I say, it's because of your warm personality and sense of humour. Again, she'll be pleased, but will also feel worried. What happens if I become depressed and anxious? Will he still love me then? The right answer is, I love you because I love you. At the end of Exodus chapter 2, God had looked and seen the groaning of his people, stuck in slavery and misery. He was concerned for them. They were helpless. They needed rescuing. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, God reveals his heart for his people. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Do you see it? All the disease, death, misery, fear, every anxiety you feel is because of the effect of sin in a fallen world. And your sin is part of the cause of it. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. 
you're enslaved by it. And despite all this, God loves you because he loves you. It's nothing to do with how good you are. It's not even about how sorry you are. You're helpless. If it's based in any way on your performance, even the quality of your Christian response, then it's not good news. Because if it depends, even in the slightest way, on me, then it's terrible news. I'll spend my time worrying that I've messed my bit up. I almost certainly will mess my bit up. That is why I need rescuing. That's why Jesus came to save me. It's undeserved grace. The hymn writer got it right with these words. Be my example and my guide, my friend, yea, everything beside. But first, last, best, whate'er betide, be to me my saviour. As I read verse 13, I can't help thinking to myself, why did the shepherds need another sign? Surely the angel of the Lord would have been enough. Top shepherds. But that would be completely missing the point of the sign. It's true, he'd be the only baby in Bethlehem in a manger. But the greater sign is that his desperate poverty points to his humbling for your sake. The wonder of the heart of God bursting with love for you in your helplessness. He couldn't sit still in heaven. He made himself as helpless as a baby for you. It points to the cross. First one angel appears, then all of a sudden an entire army of them descends. These are angels who have worshipped Jesus in heaven. They knew his glory, his magnificence, his majesty before the incarnation. They knew of man's fall. They know of the ter terrible misery caused by sin. They knew the Almighty had a plan to rescue you. They knew this rescue would mean the Son, though he was rich, for your sake he would become poor. Did they also know how much he would suffer? Did they know that the Holy Spirit would even come to live in sinful hearts like mine? Did they know that Jesus' rescue would mean you one day will share in his glory. The birth of Jesus into deprivation must have caused these angels to stand in awe at God's indescribable love. The words of Luke 2 verse 14 are an outpouring of adoration. The angels had never before been so thrilled. It's no wonder that from the bottom of their hearts they bellow, glory to God in the highest. Thirdly, there's glory in the response, verses 15 to 20, the witnesses. The sermon has been delivered and it's always the critical time. Will the hearers, including the preacher, Take it to heart and act. The angels have now left the shepherds. What are they going to do? Luke shows us the model response of these men. No hesitation. They hurried off. Now I know what you're thinking. What about the lambs? Who's going to look after them? your heart will always find a reason not to obey God's word now. Other things will always feel more important. Unless you hear and see the privilege and greater worth that is in God's words. 
Now in this section of Luke's passage, you'll notice that there's a lot of hearing, seeing and telling going on. First, the shepherds hear the message from God's messenger. Then they take steps to see Jesus the Saviour for themselves. To do this, they had to believe what they'd been told. Enough to leave the lambs. Then they tell others. They become witnesses. Do you see the remarkable change that has taken place in them? A few verses ago, they were terrified. Now they're spreading the word about Jesus, the Saviour. Are they suddenly brave because the magnificent angel has gone? We get a clue as to what's happening here from an Old Testament reference to hearing, seeing and speaking. When Isaiah was commissioned by God in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw a vision of God in his glory. Like the shepherds, he too was terrified. His terror related to understanding how unclean he was before God. It was only after his lips had been cleansed and his guilt removed that he was able to speak and he was given a message. A message to help us hear, see and tell like the shepherds. Be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. You may want to briefly turn to Isaiah chapter 6 to look at that. You'll notice in Isaiah's message that hearing and seeing are linked to the hearts of the people. If you don't hear and see and turn, you'll not be healed. That can only happen if you understand with your heart. In the middle of our passage in Luke about hearing, seeing and telling, we have a spotlight shining on Mary's heart in verse 19. Mary is the opposite of the people Isaiah was going to preach to. She treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. It's possible to come to church, to hear the words about Jesus all your life, even to see the effects of Jesus in others. But if your heart stays calloused or fat, as one version puts it, you'll never understand. The writer and pastor Tim Chester tells the story about a time he had just given a sermon in his church. And at the door, a young mother was telling him how she had been encouraged by it. Suddenly, her young four-year-old son piped up. It's not all about you, Tim. It's not all about you is a phrase they use a lot in their church. And the young lad had picked up on it and weaponized it against the pastor. When confronted by the glory of God, Isaiah realized with terror that it was not all about him. Yet he'd built his life all about himself. The main reason we do not see the glory of God in the baby in the manger is because in our hearts, it's all about us. Our hearts are fat with love for ourselves. We're focused on our feelings, our circumstances and our glory. We don't feel troubled by our lack of love for God and others as long as we feel all right. Our ears are dull to the truth about God's love for us. Why? Because we believe the lies that God really disapproves. And he doesn't really love us 
unconditionally. So we either run from him by avoiding his word, his people and prayer, or we try to impress him into loving us more. Trying to live for God can be a particular trap for Christians. You want to feel good about what you do for God. We serve in the church, but want the approval of others, or feel envious if someone else does something better, or won't serve in case some think we don't do it as well as someone else. It can be about you and your glory. That can even be a denial of the gospel, trying to earn brownie points from God, like those foolish Galatians. If this is how you live as a Christian, you're not responding to good news that causes great joy. You're trying to live up to an impossible standard, and that's crushing. The result, though, is your eyes become blind, and you don't see the glory of God in Jesus. Sometimes that's why we don't tell others about him, because to tell others mean you prefer his glory. You need saving from this by a saviour. If this describes you, then you may have completely missed the point of the baby in the manger. It's such a powerful sign because it proves God loves you deeply, even though you're helpless. The shepherds knew they were despised. They knew they needed a saviour. When they first saw the glory of God, they were terrified. They understood their sin. Then, when they saw the sign, their hearts exploded. The truth of God's love and rescue hit home. He'd come even for shepherds, especially for shepherds. Their telling came as a response to that love. It's amazing love. You and I can't see angels or the baby in the manger in the same way that the shepherds did. But you can encounter Jesus in the, go in the gospel written by Luke. The Holy Spirit stirs in us the truth of the words of God about your need to be rescued about the incredible, unchanging, costly love Jesus has for you, about all that he suffered so you can know him. As you come to understand this more, your heart will change and you'll join with the shepherds in giving glory to God. I pray that this Christmas you'll see his glory. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born that happy morning. Jesus, to thee be glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Amen.